more than overcomers, Lord. We thank you, Lord, that we always have the victory. In you, Lord, we are always victorious. We praise you this morning, Lord, and thank you for all of your blessings. In Jesus' name, everybody say praise the Lord. Praise Amen. The Lord. Give the Lord a hand clap this morning. Praise God. Amen. God bless you. you. May be seated. Thanks, Tim. Great job as always. Appreciate it. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Suzanne and Tammy and uh, Peter. Appreciate you leading us in worship. And all of you, we appreciate you uh, sharing your testimonies and, and uh, prayer requests and, and your faith. Praise God. Yeah. I was thinking, Tim quoted the scripture from Hebrews 13 8. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Yes, he is. And then he goes on to say, Be not carried away with divers and strange doctrines, mm -hmm. for it is a good thing that the heart be established with grace, mm -hmm. not with meats which have not profited them that have been occupied therein. We have an altar whereof they have no right to eat, which serve the tabernacle. He's talking about the priesthood and the, the Hebrews. Yeah. For the bodies of those beasts whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin are burned without the camp. Wherefore, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without the gate. Let us go forth, therefore, unto him without the camp, bearing his reproach. For here have we no continuing city, but we seek one to come. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. By him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. Praise the Lord. I, you know, it's what got my attention is that Jesus, see the, the, the priests uh, under the Old Covenant, they ate the sacrifice. I mean, it was bled out, and they used the blood to offer uh, at the altar, but they ate the meat. That was, their, that was their pay. That was part of their income. And this is what Jesus is telling us. Remember, he said, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no part in me. He's saying, you, you don't just have a sacrifice offered for you. That sacrifice becomes your life. It becomes the thing that strengthens you and gives you life from day to day. Day in and day out is the constant reminding of ourselves that he and I are one. You, you are what you eat. I know that's an old cliche, but it's still true. I mean, that's... What gives you your strength is what gives you the ability to live your life. Amen. And when we forget that that's what Jesus has done, he's given us the ability to live his life in this earth. Amen. We need to be reminded of that on a regular basis. Amen. We have a continuing sacrifice or a sacrifice that continues to bless forever, once and for all time. Praise God. Amen. Give him a hand clap again. Thank the Lord. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Okay. Praise God. Uh, a friend of mine told me that his pet uh, bird died. It had fallen into a can of varnish and drowned. It was a sad way to die, he said, but uh, sure had a beautiful finish. Praise the Lord. This guy was having a little trouble with the uh, identity. It's the world that we live in, right? So he goes to the psychologist, and the psychologist is trying to get him to identify with different things so he could identify with himself, right? Mm -hmm. And so the, the psychologist says, well, look, imagine you're an Indian teepee. And then he says, now imagine you're a wigwam. And the patient says, oh, come on, doc, you're making me too tense. <laughs> Okay, I'll, I won't worry out too much. We've got two graduations to go to, and, and Suzanne's got to go to L.A. She's left. She's already left. I don't really feel all that sorry for Suzanne. Very <laughs> sorry. Amen. A length of rope went into a bar, and he sat on the stool, and he ordered a beer. The bartender said, we don't serve ropes in here. Dismayed and a little disappointed, the rope went out, and then he got an idea. He stopped a man and asked him, he said, would you tie a knot in me and then separate the strands at both ends? Having done that, he, the rope went back into the bar 
And again, he ordered a beer. The bartender said, hey, aren't you the same rope who was in here before? And the rope replied, no, I'm afraid not. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Okay, glory to God. <laughs> I love the, the testimonies and all this morning because uh, for some reason they, they always, well, I don't know what, I mean, for some reason, it's the Holy Spirit. We all have that same spirit, and so we speak in the same things. But the idea that God has spoken to you in some way, whether it's a promise, whether it's a dream, whether it's a vision, whether it's just the inner voice in you, or it's the, the, the literal word of God, the scripture, God is always talking to us. He's always speaking to us. Amen. And, uh, you know, when you use the term dreams, we think of dreams, but that's just God talking. He has, sometimes he has to have us unconscious in order for us to be quiet enough to where we can actually hear what the Spirit is saying. And uh, so, you know, when you talk about dreams or visions and that, they're all synonymous uh, terms that basically just mean something that God's promised to do, something that God said to you, either through his word or directly uh, to your spirit. So I want to I wanna talk about those things this morning. And to do that, let's begin with Genesis chapter 37. And we'll read verses 3 through 8. Genesis 37, 3 through 8. Sometimes we can get so specific in the way that we think that we miss God. I mean, uh, Joseph had a dream. But it was just a word from God. It was just a way for God to be able to speak to him because he didn't have the Holy Spirit. So he couldn't direct, speak directly to his spirit. So he had to speak to his consciousness. And the only way to do that was to get him to go to sleep. And quit thinking so that God could then plant the, the promise or the plan that God had for him. So he said, now Israel loved Joseph more than all his children because he was the son of his old age and he made him a coat of many colors. When his brethren saw that their father loved him more than all his brethren, they hated him and could not speak peaceably unto him. And Joseph dreamed a dream and he told it his brethren and they hated him yet the more. And he said unto them, here I pray you this dream which I have dreamed. For behold, we were binding sheaves in the field, and lo, my sheaf arose and also stood upright. And behold, your sheaf stood round about and made obeisance to my sheep. And his brethren said to him, Shalt thou indeed reign over us, or shalt thou indeed have dominion over us? And they hated him yet the more for his dreams and for his words. And so Joseph told his dream, and when he told the dream, I get this. It wasn't until he told the dream that problems started rising. As long as he just kept it to himself, yeah. it was fine. Yeah. But God is giving him an inheritance. You know, the, the father gives him this coat, and that's representative of you are the main guy. You're the guy that's going to get the inheritance. You're, the, you're the, the, the special one, right? And, that, and his brothers knew that. They understood that. And when they saw that coat and recognized that he's the favorite one, they know they're getting the short end of the stick when this thing is all said and done. And so that's one of the reasons why they hated him. But they also hated him because he had the guts to stand up and say what was really going on, what he really believed, you know. And so Joseph told the dream, and when he told the dream, that's when it looked like everything began to implode on him. Because his brethren hated it. They hated the fact that he had the dream. They hated the fact that he told about the dream. They hated the fact for what the dream was about. They hated everything about it. Amen. So look at uh, now Peter verses 9 and 10. Still Genesis 37, but verses 9 and 10 now. And he dreamed yet another dream and told it his brethren and said, Behold, I have dreamed a dream more. And behold, the sun and the moon and the eleven stars made obeisance to me. And he told it to his father and to his brethren. And his father rebuked him and said unto him, What is this dream that thou hast dreamed? Shall I and thy mother and thy brethren indeed come to bow down ourselves to thee, to the earth? And so here's the key phrase to all this. What is this dream that you dreamed? Mm -hmm. Amen. What is the promise that God's given? What is the word yeah. that God has spoken to you? Now, I, I, maybe it's multiple things, but there's something I know in every one of us that God is de dealing with us about, has dealt with us about, and will continue to deal with us. Yes. Amen. It's not punishment. It's not correction. It's a purpose. It's a plan. It's something about what God is trying to accomplish, amen, in this earth, and you're a part of it. So 
what is this dream that thou hast dreamed? Amen. That's where you start in terms of manifestation. You've got to think about it. You've got to make yourself aware of it. You've got to stay conscious of it. And you've got to be willing to speak it, to share it. Amen. Now, what, what God is doing is preparing Joseph for manifestation. Now, how's he going to know that it's what God said if he doesn't know beforehand what God wants to do? How will he know that it's God when it happens? How can he trust God for this thing unless he has some idea of what it is that God's wanting to do? That's the, that's the reason why God shares things with us about what he wants to do with us, what he wants to do through us, amen, and for us and by us, amen. One of the first things Joseph had to do was dream. He had to get a word from God before he could do anything else. He couldn't do anything other than what his brothers did, unless he had a word from God. He had, in other words, he had to get past his sense realm. Yeah. He had to get back and past what just normal thinking and logic would dictate. Because the things that he was saying were so off the wall compared to what his brothers would have expected from this kid. The younger one, 17 years old, probably 16, 17 years old at the time. And he's telling these guys that have been working the fields and taking care of the cattle and the the sheep and all this for years before he even came along and now he's telling them y'all going to be working for me praise the lord so if we're not going to be effective if we're if there's some way for us to be effective and if we're going to be effective in the spirit because it doesn't matter what we do in the flesh that's all going to pass anyway amen so he's if we're going to somehow be effective in the spirit realm or in the kingdom of god you're going to have to dream you're going to have to believe some things that God is saying to you that don't make sense to you naturally. Amen. Because that's what dreams are. They're outside the norm. You all had dreams. And when you dream a dream, typically the dream is so bizarre. Things don't fit. You see people that don't look like who they are, but you know that's who it is. Right? I mean, has that happened to any of you? Or, or it's so unnatural the way the dream plays out you know you got one weird thing going on here and then all of a sudden something just as weird right here and yet they make perfect sense in the dream yeah. because you're not using logic you're not using intellect it's all spirit it's all coming to through the subconscious amen so God has made it so that everybody can dream yeah. praise the Lord and it isn't just night dreams I'm talking about we I was talking uh, to Peter and and uh, Suzanne, or maybe not directly talking to them, but I was listening to them talk. I was doing what I a lot of times do. I eavesdrop. So I was listening to them talk, and they're talking about God has spoken about this thing he was wanting to do here in this church and how he was going to bring different people in and how he was going to do that and how it would impact other people and so on and so forth. That's a dream. Now, you may not have been asleep. You know what I'm saying? It may have just been something that came to you like a daydream or it may have been just something that came to you as a inner voice it's just but here's the deal here's how you know it because i've had these things and i'm not going to go into the dreams i've had and talk about me but i'm just saying i've what i learned about dreams is if they won't leave you alone it's probably from god yes. if it's just a bad pizza you had or you know some late night snack or whatever then it'll go away when the nausea goes away right, right? but if it's god it'll just keep bugging you yes. the next day it'll, it'll just keep coming back to you and day after day it, it'll just keep coming back like hey I, I meant what I said. This is true. This is the truth. Amen. So God's made it so that everybody can dream somehow, some way. Everybody is going to be able to receive from God, in other words. Amen. It's not so much that God singled out one man, Joseph here, and, and just let him have a dream. God does this with all of us. Yes, he, does. he does it with everybody. Amen. We are all capable of dreaming or receiving from God. Some way, some form. Amen. In fact, Satan is a dream stealer. We've got dream catchers at our house. I'm a little hesitant to get too close to him. I think there may be some voodoo involved. But we've got a granddaughter that loves making them, and they're, they're pretty, and we, I mean, they're just decorations. So too excited. It's like a Christmas tree, you know. It's okay. You can have one, praise the Lord. But I'm just saying, that's Satan. That's what he, he's a dream stealer. He's not a dream catcher. He tries to steal dreams. In fact, that's what his job is. He'll try to steal a dream and then turn it into a nightmare. Yeah. He'll try to take the promise that God has for you and drive you nuts yes. with it because yes. you're trying to figure out some rational way for this thing to work. Yes. And it happens to all of us because we know that's what God told me. But I don't see any possible way that this thing can ever work. Yes. 
There's just nothing aligned with it outside of this voice that I've heard or this feeling that I've got or this vision that I had. Amen. And nothing, the rest of it, none of it makes any sense how it could actually take place. Amen. So what, what we want to do is come back to the dreams that God has given us. That's what I'm hearing this morning. That's what I heard last week. That's what I hear from all of us. We're all thinking these same things. God said this to me. I, I want to see it happen. I want to experience it. Right, Ron? I mean, that's what you're saying. I know God's promised things to Ron 50 years ago probably. Yeah. Haven't seen it all. But we're still believing for it. All of us have things like this. And, and maybe, it's, maybe it's been six months for you. Maybe it's been six years for more. Maybe it's been 60 years. But God's not caught in time. He's not... He's not manipulated by time. Whatever he said, it's going to happen. You, the more you try to figure it out, the more confused you're going to become. Right. Amen? Inside of that dream, now listen to me, is your purpose. Yes. Now see, that's why I won't leave you alone, Don. Now you've done some things in life. Obviously, you've raised a family. You've got... A large family, you've got friends, you've, got, you've had influence in business, and so on and so forth. But see, that's not the thing. That was all good. And we're excited, and we're happy for it, and we appreciate God using that to bless us. But there's always that haunting, nagging thing at the back that says, but this isn't it. Oh, this is good, but this isn't it. This isn't the thing that gets me up every morning to, to, to trust God again today, to see what God's going to do and how he's going to do it. Amen. Because inside the dream is our purpose. And inside that purpose lies your potential. If you don't know you have purpose, you'll never step out to do any part of that purpose. And then God cannot help you to strengthen you for that purpose. Right. You understand what I'm saying? So when he gives you a dream or when he gives you a promise or a word, the reason for that is because within that promise is a purpose that he has designed for you specifically. And that's why it won't leave you alone because you know innately, you know in your spirit, this is God. This is something God's really do, going to do. And I don't know how he's going to do it because it doesn't make sense naturally. Right. But yet it won't leave me alone right. because it was God. Right. Amen. And so he, Joseph dreamed a dream. The reason it won't leave you alone is because God uses that, that desire, that longing to bring about the potential that he has for you. The purpose that he has, and the purpose is great, but without potential to perform the purpose, the purpose is worthless. Right. It's just another, you know, unexperienced or unexplained reality uh -huh. that you don't get ex to, to be a part of. Amen? Joseph dreamed a dream. And then he told his brothers, and his brothers got jealous. Mm -hmm. Matthew 15, uh, verses 10 through 14. Matthew 15. Verse 10 through 14. Praise the Lord. And he called the multitude and said unto them, Hear and understand. Not that which goeth into the mouth defileth a man, but that which cometh out of the mouth, this defileth a man. Then came his disciples and said unto him, Knowest thou that the Pharisees were offended after they heard this saying? But he answered and said, Every plant which my heavenly Father hath not planted shall be rooted up. Let them alone, they be blind leaders of the blind, and if the blind lead the blind, both shall fall into the ditch. So Jesus said, it isn't what, what you're receiving, it isn't what you're eating, it isn't what you're drinking, inhaling, or whatever, that's your problem. The problem is what's coming out of your mouth is what's ruining you. So what's coming out of your mouth is you're not agreeing with what God said. Amen, because that's what he said. Look, don't worry about it because they don't know what they're talking about anyway. Right? They're, they're not ever going to, they're not going to be able to help you because you know more than they know. You just don't know that you know more than they know. Yeah. They're trying to make this about rules and regulations yes. and do certain things and, and take in certain things and don't take in other things. Right. And then it'll all happen for you. And he's saying, no, the reason you're not experiencing the dream, the reason you're not seeing the fulfillment of this dream is one of two reasons. Either it's not the fullness of time yet for that to take place or... You're not staying consistent right. with your faith. Right. You're saying stuff sure. that negates what God said. Right. That can never happen for me. Well, if, if he was going to do it, surely he would have done it. But you know how we are. That's, and and uh, relationships and everything. We start running our mouth without thinking. Not realizing we're undermining the very thing God's going to try to do because 
He has given us authority, and it's through words that we exercise authority. That's how we show that we have dominion, and so on and so forth. So the devil, he doesn't care whether you understand it or don't understand it. His whole point is to get you to say something other than what God said so that he can stop the thing from working. Praise the Lord. Amen. And then Proverbs uh, uh, 29, 18 says, Without vision, you know, the people perish. Without some purpose or without some plan, amen, people just deteriorate. They just fall apart. Amen. So a lack of vision or what God wants to do is give us direction is what he's trying to show us. Amen. Because here's the thing. We think always in specifics. If I give somebody an order when I, when I was in sales or when I was in the military, sergeant, I had people, you know, you got people over, you got people under you and you expect them to do what they're told to do. Right. Because if they don't, the whole system breaks down the same way in a company. It's yeah. that way in everything. A family. It, there has to be obedience to what. The command is to yes. do what it is you're told to do to perform your to perform your job. So what God here's the deal, because if that's the way we operate, we figure, OK, we don't let people think outside the box. Generally, we have a way and we know that it works. And so we want you to do it this way. Yeah. I appreciate your creativity, but I can't afford it. Right. I mean, it's got to work. And I know this works. So you need to do it this way. Well, when God gives us a dream, we have that same kind of tunnel vision. We go, okay, this is how he's going to do it. But see, God can do the same thing yeah. any way he wants to. And that's what he told Don. Yeah. I just changed the plan. Yeah. The plan's the same. The purpose is the same. Exactly. But the means by which we'll accomplish it yeah. will change. change. Right. Because you're not quite on board with everything that I say. You think you are. You think you know. But you don't. Yeah. Right? Exactly. But it's okay because... God has a million different ways to perform the same thing. Sure Thoughts we haven't even come to our mind yet. We think, oh, there's no way he can do this because I've tried and it doesn't work. Right? And I've had people with influence help me and it still doesn't work. And God can do it in a heartbeat without any effort whatsoever. And you go, what in the world was that? How did that happen? How did that take place? See, one reason people don't get what God has given them is because they're intimidated. And they think inside the box. In here, they think in terms of human reason and understanding. And whenever you do that, you've separated yourself from God already because he, he don't think the way we think. Now, we have the capacity to think the way he thinks, but he's never going to think like we think. He's expecting us to put on the mind of Christ and think like him. Think with faith. Amen. So he wants us to stop thinking intellectually and start thinking by the Spirit. Praise the Lord. Joseph, for, in order for Joseph to accomplish the dream God had given him, he had to get outside the box. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what he was trying to do by showing his... He was exposing this thing. He was saying, this is, this is what God's going to do. You know? And of course, to do that, it ruffled some feathers when he started talking about what God wanted to do. Amen? So he had to get outside the box. He had to get from... He had to get to the spirit of faith. Now, he doesn't have the spirit of God... But he can still exercise faith in a word from God, in the promise from God. That's what all the prophets and the kings did throughout the Old Testament. So one side of that box that he's having trouble, that he has to get outside of, is fear. The fear of failing. The fear of it not happening. The fear of somehow you screwing it up. Amen. And so what he does is basically he exposes this thing so he has no way out. He can't turn back. Now I've confessed. This is what God told me. Now I can't, I can't go back on it. I either got to say, well, it wasn't God and I misunderstood it, or else I'm going to have to stick with this thing until God brings it to pass. Amen? And it has happened to all of us. We've all got things unfulfilled, un uh, incomplete, let me say it that way. And we know, but we still know it's there. And here's what happens. We do get older, and the circumstances don't seem to change. Maybe they even get worse. And we think, okay, well, I missed that somewhere. Somehow I had to have missed it. Right? Or it would have been done. Because yeah. right. I want it done. Yeah. Yeah. And I know God wants it done or he wouldn't have told me he was going to do it. Yeah. The problem is God doesn't work within my time frame. He doesn't use my timelines. He's got his plan and his plan is going to come about. You know, believe me, the people wanted their Messiah long before Jesus showed up. I mean, they were praying for him. They were looking for him to appear. But in the fullness of time, God sent forth his son. To do the plan that he had. Yeah. To fulfill the purpose. Right? So look at Hebrews 13 verse 5. 
I'm just going to throw a few scriptures out here just, just for context here. But Let your conversation be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. For he hath said, I will never leave you or forsake you. That's scripture. That's God's word. That's God speaking. I will never leave you or forsake you. Never leave you or forsake you. How many of you believe it? That's the word of God. He's never. You may feel like he's abandoned me. You may go through months where it feels like God has got nothing to do with me. He's not helping. He's not involved. He's just kind of sitting back going, see, I told you the bad stuff happens in this world. No. He said, I'll never leave you and I'll never forsake you. I don't care what it looks like. I don't care what it sounds like. I don't care what the enemy's trying to tell you. I'm telling you, I'm here. I'm with you and I'm not going anywhere. Yes. Praise the Lord. Romans 8 verse 31. Because what I want to do is stir up the promise, stir up the dream, stir up the, the, the word that God has given you. And I know what the devil's going to do. He's going to say, that's just Nathan talking, you know. I mean, how many times do you have to go down this road before you figure it out? He ain't doing it. He ain't here. He isn't involved. Yes, he'll never leave you or forsake you. What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? The things are the things, right? The stuff. And what do we say to those things? Oh my God, here it comes again. We're going to go through the whole mess. Oh, no, here's what you say to those things. Who can be against me? If God's for me, why would I worry about anything that might try to come against me? And I already know He's not going to leave me or forsake me. Praise the Lord. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14. 2 Corinthians 2, 14. Now thanks be unto God, which always causes us to triumph in Christ. Now, I know we're, we're talking about Jesus, the man, but we're also talking about the Word of God. The Word was with God, the Word was God. You can't separate Jesus from the Word. And so, He always causes us to triumph in Christ, in the Word. Stay in the Word and you will succeed. You will always be victorious because it cannot be defeated. And it's the way we embrace Christ yes. in this life, right now. And make it manifest the savor of his knowledge by us. By us. How, do you, how does God get known? By us. And how, does, how do we make it known? By always causing us to triumph in Christ. By us always trusting in the victory in Christ causes us to reveal the knowledge in every place. Praise the Lord. Yes, Lord. <clears throat> Joshua 1 5. There shall not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. I will not fail thee yes. nor forsake thee. Praise the Lord. Those are just four promises, but they're all covenant promises. Yes. Meaning, God cannot break them. They're a promise from God. They are a covenant from God. So if God doesn't keep the promises, then I'll give you your offering back and let's just go home. Right. Because we're wasting time. Yeah, we are. Either this is true, right. or we're wasting time. Right. Just yes. Praise the Lord. It's not what goes in the mouth that defiles, it's what comes out of the mouth. And when people go around in fear, they go around with perverse speech. And they think corrupt thoughts. And those thoughts play strongholds in their minds. And they become paralyzed to the spiritual promise. Fear is designed to paralyze you. First thing the devil has to do yep. is get you afraid. Yep. That's why Jesus, uh, 365 times, which is one for every day of the year, yep. in the scripture says, fear not. Why? Because he knows that the first thing the devil will use to get you out of the will of God is fear. That's what he always uses. He comes to steal, kill, and destroy. God hasn't given you the spirit of fear. 
but of peace, love, joy, and a sound mind. So if you're in fear, there's only one source for that. And it ain't God. So when you're afraid, no, it's the devil messing with you because you've got an agenda, you've got a purpose, you've got a reason for being here, and he's trying to keep you from ever experiencing it and ever releasing it into the lives of other people around you. That's what he did to Jesus. If you're the son of God, come worship me, come on. Jesus said, no. Resist the devil and he'll flee. The devil comes against you and he comes against you with fear. So the vision you had is being sapped and it slowly diminishes because fear has come in. I, you know, there's been different times when God has dealt with me specifically and, and I did things. And I can tell you, all kinds of crap happens that can be scary because it's not normal. It's just stuff that starts happening out of the clear blue just simply because you're doing something that you know God told you to do. The first instinct is to stop doing it, stupid. I mean, if it hurts, quit. Right? I mean, isn't that normally what we think? So fear will cut off that, that spirit of vision or the sense of knowing this is God. This is, this is what God wants me to do. If he can get you frightened enough, he'll get you to where you're thinking, no, oh, maybe it wasn't God. I mean, God doesn't want to hurt me, surely. You see what I'm saying? So whatever the fear is in your life, you have to attack it. Yes. And how do you attack it? With the Word of God. Whatever it is He's telling you, well, you're going to get cancer because so-and-so had cancer. Well, you're getting old, so this will happen. No! no way. That's not my history. That's somebody else's stuff. I, I don't have to have it. I don't have to That's live right. with it. I don't have to buy into it. That's right. Praise the Lord. Amen. You have to replace that with faith. Yep. And the only way to do that is by the Word of God. Romans 10, verse 17. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Simple enough. If you're in fear, the best way to, con uh, to combat fear is faith. How do you get faith? You go to the word of God. You get a word. Get a promise. Go back. Take it back. Amen. Genesis chapter 3, verse 10. Now, what did Adam? Adam was given a promise. Yep. Dominion. You got it all. It's all yours. Right? Just take authority. And he said, I heard their voice in the garden and I was afraid. Now, why was he afraid? Wasn't because of God. No. I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. Praise the Lord. Why? Because faith perverted is fear. Yes. Yes. Yeah, I mean, you, we know this because when you step out in faith, crap usually happens. Things start shaking and shouting. I mean, when you, you're going to do something for God and you step out and start doing it. Yeah. It's like all hell breaks loose and you're thinking, whoa, wait a minute. I thought if I'm in the will of God, everything's going to just flow like the river. Yeah, it'll flow like a river and Satan will come in like a flood and try to uh, capsize your canoe. You know, he, he wants to mess with the plan. Yes, he, does. he doesn't just back off because God gave it. I mean, if that were the case, he would have never tempt, tried to tempt Jesus in the desert. Right. He knew who he was, and he knows who you are. He's hoping you won't know. That's right. He's hoping that Jesus won't really fully identify with who he is in, Christ, in God. Amen? Yes. And so that's why he does what he does. Amen? Faith perverted is fear. In other words, it's twisted. And that's why Jesus called them a perverse generation. Because yeah. where they should have been exercising faith, they were operating in fear. Yeah. Look at uh, Matthew 17, uh, 17 through 20. Then Jesus answered and said, O faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him hither to me. And Jesus rebuked the devil and he departed out of him and the child was cured from that very hour. Then came the disciples apart and said, why couldn't we cast him out? And Jesus said unto them, because of your unbelief. Yeah. For verily I say unto you, if you have faith as a grain of a mustard seed, you'll say to this mountain, remove hence to yonder place and it will remove and nothing shall be impossible unto you. Now what you know the story. 
this kid is having like epileptic seizures of some kind and probably foaming at the mouth and vomiting and crapping himself and yeah. urinating on him. I mean, come on, have you ever seen anybody lose all control? That's what happens. Yeah. Amen. So these disciples, look, what, hap- what, what did that do to them? It scared the crap out of them. Yeah. It scared them. They had never seen it like that before. That's what they said. We've never seen it on this, on this way. And then they said, why couldn't we do it? And Jesus said, because of your unbelief. Why were they in unbelief? Because they were afraid. They were paralyzed with fear. Praise the Lord. A twisted generation. So we've got to get the fear out. As long as there's fear, there's no faith. Amen. The moment you step outside that box, fear hits. Now all this pertains to Joseph because... He was being raised up by God. He had, God had a purpose for him. Amen. And when God moved Joseph to Egypt, Joseph was being placed in an environment that he needed to be in to maximize the potential of God's purpose. So a lot of times we look at where we are and we think, what am I doing here? What is this all about? What is this job supposed to be about when it's nothing but a pain? What is this relationship about when it seems to constantly be a hassle and a nightmare and a bad deal and this and what about this, you know, this uh, uh, sickness? And I, I know, I know, but I mean, I keep feeling, what, what is the purpose here? What is this all about? God knows where you're supposed to be. Praise the Lord. That's why I told Don, this isn't where I sent you. This is where you came. This is where you went. Yeah. But here's the deal. God can make wherever that is mm-hmm. the place that he's going to work. Yes. They threw yes. him in a pit. They threw him, you know, in, in a prison. They th- all these things were happening to him, and yet God still had a plan. He said, I'm still going to do what I told you to do. Amen? God knows what that place is. Yes, he, does. he knows where that place is. He knows what those emotions are. Mm-hmm. Amen? Amen? The reason you don't is because you didn't create you. Yeah. You've just been living with you yeah. for however long you've been around. Uh-huh. Amen? He's the only one who really knows all about you. That's the truth. We think we do, but our whole life passes almost before we go, oh, that's me. Yeah. That's, kind of, that's kind of me. That's what I do. That's the way I think. That's the way I respond. But God knew that before I breathed my first yeah. breath. God knew exactly how I would respond. He knew exactly how I would relate to situations and circumstances because he created me. Now, I, didn't, I wasn't always like this. <laughs> Praise the Lord, I wish I'd have known you then. But you know what I'm saying? We grow into these things. We, we start out, we're as intimidated as little kids as anybody else is. And then you go through life and you go through a marriage and falls apart and you you know you get in the military and all things are different everything changes and you have to adapt you got to figure out okay how does my personality work in this situation probably not so good maybe i ought to adapt a little bit you understand what i'm saying you learn to work within your life how that works how it how it'll happen the way it's supposed to the way god intended it to and that's really more about being sensitive to God than it is about your doing certain things. Mm-hmm. Amen. So why the fear? I mean, why uncertainty? Why mystery? Why? Why can't it just be get up and it's all clear and we just do it and it's good? Praise the Lord. I mean, that's what we want. That's the way we want it. Just tell me and I'll do it. Yeah. Yeah. But the Bible gives us a hint for why this contradiction or this Wherever there is a promise, there's always resistance. There's always something that seems to want to keep us from experiencing whatever that promise is that God's given us. Amen? So look at this briefly in Isaiah chapter 62. I'm just going to read a couple of verses here to kind of set this up. Isaiah 62, uh, verses 10 through 12. See, there's this spiritual picture that God's trying to give us here. And it's a picture of a city that's called the community of the redeemed, or Zion. Amen? And and so we'll read this, and it's literal. It's it's true. It's talking to people. But everything here is spiritual. All the word, his word is spirit, and it's truth. And when we start reading it literal and just reading it as though it were prose of some kind, 
It doesn't help us. It doesn't do any good for us. It just gives information. This is revelation, and that's what he's trying to get us to understand. Read this with eyes of revelation, with the eyes of God, and stop reading it as a textbook and start reading it as a life book, you know, a, a life, uh, uh, what do I want to call it, biology, or bi biology, a biography, big word, I don't use it. Go through, go through the gates, prepare you the way of the people, cast up, cast up the highway, gather out the stones, lift up a standard for the people, behold, the Lord hath proclaimed unto the end of the world, say ye to the daughter of Zion, behold, thy salvation cometh, behold, his reward is with him, and his work before him. So go through, go through the gates, he says, and they shall call them the holy people, the redeemed of the Lord, and thou shalt be called, sought out, a city not forsaken. He's talking about you and me. Amen. Look at uh, Isaiah 60 and verse 18. Violence shall no more be heard in thy land, wasting nor destruction within thy borders, but thou shalt call thy walls salvation and thy gates praise. That's important. Thy gates praise. Hallelujah. Revelation 21, 21. And the twelve gates were twelve pearls, and every several gate was with one pearl, and the street of the city was pure gold, as it were transparent glass. Praise the Lord. So how's a pearl form? Everybody knows it's through irritation and conflict. Mm -hmm. So a grain of sand gets into the oyster shell, and then the, the oyster kind of en encompasses it or wraps itself around it to keep it from doing any damage. And because of that constant irritation, a pearl gets formed. Mm -hmm. Takes years and years and years, but it happens, amen? The pearl forms and it forms around that grain to keep it from doing any damage. Now, the Bible pairs up praise, amen, and irritation. Mm -hmm. And it's not a coincidence. Mm -hmm. Amen? Yeah. When you are stuck in conflict, when you're stuck in uncertainty, and you still trust God, yes. to God, that's a sacrifice. Yeah. Amen? And it creates something beautiful to God. Yeah. And he calls it praise. Yes. We think it's when we're, hey, praise the Lord, hallelujah, glory to God. That's all good. And I'm not saying we shouldn't do that. I'm just saying that that's not God's first priority when it comes to praise. What he wants to do is see us in conflict. In yeah. other words, we've got a word. We've got a promise from God. And there's a conflict. Why? There's an irritation. Why? Because nobody else believes it. And everything in the world is fighting yes. against me ever experiencing it or seeing it manifested. Yes. And God says, if you can praise me over the promise... In the midst of all the irritants and all of the uh, seeming impossibility of this thing, that is praise. Yes. If you'll trust me when it looks like there's no way this can happen, but yet you've got a word from me, he calls it praise. Yes. That's praising the Lord. Now we think, okay, well, we can deny that. We can just say, well, God, if that was you, we'd have it by now. Or how come this crap's still going on? Why is this happening? Why isn't that happening? But I praise you, Lord. That is so lame. You know, it's the passive-aggressive kind of things that drive me crazy in life. You know, it's like, you know, I really appreciate you, Nathan, but... And you know, they didn't mean one word about that. I really appreciate you because here comes the truth. But... You know, you're an idiot. You never make a point. You don't do what you should put. You know, you're always making a mess out of things, and you're not making any sense, and thank you very much. But see, that's what happens. That's what, that's what we do. That's how we get to the place where we say, well, you know, I don't know. If God was going to do it, he would have done it by now. And, you know, well, if, I, if, if I'm healed, then how come I still got this pain? How come this is still aching? If I'm healed, how come these shoulders hurt like the devil every time I roll over in bed at night? You know, if I'm, if I'm healed, how come I still got these pains and these aches? If I'm prospered, then why is this job such a mess? Why am I not getting a raise? Why, why don't I have enough money to take care of my bills if I've got everything that I need to have? You see what I'm saying? And then we want to say praise, but praise the Lord. And God's saying, where did that come from? Because you're calling me a liar with, in one breath and then saying, but praise the Lord. In other words, you know, you're really good, God, but 
And this hasn't happened, and you didn't do this, and you haven't done that, and I'm still going through this mess. And believe me, God understands people. He understands the passive, aggressive nature that we have. See, here's the deal. When we're stuck in uncertainty, when we're in conflict, and we still trust God, that's praise. Yes. That's something beautiful. In that moment, this is what these scriptures are talking about. In that moment when I do that, a gate opens. Yes. Amen. I'm in the middle of nothing is happening like God said it was going to happen. And yet, I say, I'm not being moved here. And it ain't happening, but that doesn't mean it won't happen. It will happen because I'm not going to give up on what you promised me. I'm not going to let go of it. I'm not going to give in to it. I'm going to believe. I'm just going to keep on believing. And God said, you hear that? That's praise. Open the gate. There's a gate there. Praise the Lord. There's a gate. And it's form, it forms an entrance for the king of glory, amen, to invade yes. the situation. You know yes. the scripture says, lift up your heads, O ye gates, and the king of glory, yes. amen, will come in. God's looking for a pathway. Yes. He's looking for a gate into this realm because yes. he has to get here in order to do, amen, what he has already done. Or to see manifestation of what he's already done. Yes. And how does it happen? It doesn't happen by you saying, God, you know you're like the, the seven-year-old grandson. And he's, he's about as thin-skinned as they come. I don't, this, this, I mean, I love the kid, but he, you could just look funny, and he's in tears practically. He just, he just gets upset over anything. Just strange. And the other, the other three, they could care less. You know, I mean, I look out the back door. Our deck, you walk out the door of the deck, and then there's this crab apple tree, and it happened to be in full bloom. I look out the back door, and there's the six-year-old, and he's standing there, peeing halfway across the yard. <laughs> I mean, right off the deck. He's not out behind a tree somewhere. He's not hiding in a shelter. He's standing right there by the deck. How's this? It's working. It's working good. And I'm thinking, I'm going to be waiting in that. And about, get out. I said, what are you doing? And he looked at me like, obvious, isn't it? Uh, surely you know what I'm doing, Popo. But I'm saying, doesn't bother him. I mean, he's not bothered in the least. But Clint, he's, you know, if you kind of rub him the wrong way, he just gets all freaked out. He just gets crazy. And that's what happens with us a lot of times. We, we think we're, we know what we're supposed to be doing, and we got a word from God. And then when it doesn't happen exactly the way we thought it should happen, or somebody questions why it hasn't happened, <laughs> When we ought to just be out there peeing off the deck, we're ranting and raving and crying and carrying on about all kinds of stuff. I know this is a stretch here, but I'm just saying, we shouldn't be worrying so much, amen, about how it looks. Let's just trust God. Let's give Him praise in the midst of all of this. Let's just believe God. I mean, how can God promise to provide? And then I got all this crap going on. That can't be right. That's exactly the way it is. Because in order for a gate to open, yes. there has to be conflict. There has to be some resistance to this thing. Otherwise, it's not faith. Yeah. Exactly. And you can say, well, I believe God. Don't tell me you believe God and you're questioning why he isn't doing what you said. He now, you can question you and why I haven't done what I thought I should do. But it doesn't matter. I mean, that's what was so great about what Don said. Because, look, we've all done this. We've all thought we were just moving in with the flow of God or we just thought, what difference does it make? You know, the thing here isn't working, I'll go somewhere else. Only to find out that might have been exactly where I was supposed to be. And now what? I can't go undo 25, 30, 40, 50 years and, and no. So God allows deviation from the plan, but the plan still proceeds. It still goes forward if you don't give up on it. Praise the Lord. Psalms uh, 87, verse 2. 
See, a lot of people have no gate, and the reason they don't have a gate is because they won't trust or they won't believe in the middle of an apparent paradox. In other words, they really don't want to use faith. They have to have evidence. Right. Evidence is not faith. So if you don't have faith, you cannot be a gate. If you cannot be a gate, then there's never any manifestation, and then that justifies your reason for not believing. You see what I'm saying? We, we build our own failure. It's built in. Amen. To our humanity, to our natural way of thinking. And that's why God says you've got to get out of the flesh. You've got to think according to the word of God in order for, to see any of it take place. Why? Because that's when you become a gate, a portal for the supernatural to invade the natural. Yes. Praise the Lord. You are the means by which God gets into this planet. Praise God. So the Lord loved. He loveth the gates of Zion more than all the dwellings of Jacob. That gate or that place of faith or praise in the middle of conflict is where his presence rests. Mm -hmm. yep. mm -hmm. And God was with Joseph. Yes. Joseph is in the middle of a conflict. All yes. sorts of irritants. All sorts of resistance. And yet it says he believed God. He became a gate and God rested with him. God stayed with him. And in the middle of all the negativity, God was with him. Yes. Praise the Lord. The gate is formed... When we move above human explanation yep. and into a place of trust. Yep. The more you rationalize a promise from God, the more yep. impossible it becomes. Yep. We are joint heirs with Jesus Christ. Joseph was told of an inheritance. He didn't understand it all, but you're seeing two things play out here. You're seeing the physical. The Father gives him the coat of many colors, which identified him as the heir, as the prince, if you will, in that family. Yes. Praise the Lord. And God, so, so he, he's, he, J, Jacob in a sense is saying, you are going to be the one to inherit. You're going to get the promise of all that we have here. Yes. It's going to be yours. You're going to be in charge of all of it. Amen. So a spiritual inheritance is about making us more effective and efficient. It's not just for our gratification. Now, Joseph got a, a huge blessing out of this. But it really wasn't about his getting the blessing. It was about him being a blessing. It was about him being in a place where God could use him to do what God wanted to do. Amen. In spite of the natural. In spite of the normal that was going on around him. Amen. It's good. It's pleasant. It's enjoyable. It's encouraging. But it just... It's not just for personal consumption. You see what I'm saying? If you're doing what God tells you to do, it'll be all right. I mean, it'll be good. You'll, you'll be content with it. You'll be happy with it. But it isn't just about you consuming it on yourself. Right. You are blessed to be a blessing. Yes. That's what he's trying to get us to understand. Yes. Yeah, we won't be fulfilled. We won't be complete. We won't feel content. And satisfied until we are in that place, until we are that gate. But it isn't just about us feeling good about ourselves. That's part of it. You can't be blessed. You know, it can't be a blessing without being blessed. So we get benefit from it. But it isn't just for our benefit. It's because if I'm in the right place at the right time where God told me to do, to do what God's telling me to do, I'm going to be a blessing automatic. It's just automatic. It happens. Praise the Lord. So it's good. It's pleasant. It's all those things. But it's in order, see, we're, we're, it's to open doors to the king yeah. and his kingdom mm -hmm. so that he has more influence in places that he didn't have influence before. Right. So why did God want Joseph in Egypt? Because God wanted to bless not just Joseph's family. He wanted to bless Egypt. Yes. Yes. Praise the Lord. Right? I mean, that, he wants to bless everybody. It's not his will that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. Think about it. He, this was a chance for Egypt to avoid the plagues, yes. the destruction, and the fact that that country has never risen up to its no. original stature since. No. Praise the Lord. God wanted to bless them. Mm -hmm. He wanted to because he's wanting to expand his influence into places that it hasn't been before. Right. A natural inheritance, I mean, most of you know this, gives you something you didn't have before. 
But a spiritual inheritance pulls back the curtain and reveals what we already have permission to possess. Yes. We get born again and we already have an inheritance. Yeah. The reason for that inheritance isn't to give us something we didn't have, right. but to make us aware of what we have, what we already yes. had in Christ. Yes. Amen. And that's why the scripture says those things which are revealed belong to us yeah. and our children forever. Yeah. Praise the Lord. We were never intended to live any part of our lives outside of the outpouring or influence of the Spirit of God. Yes. That's our problem. We live part-time. Sure. And the rest of the time, we just fake it with everybody else out there trying to make it. Just try yeah. to get by. Amen? Yeah. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. And he talks about us from glory to glory, uh, being changed into the image yes. of God. We we're all with open face beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. Amen? So he always makes us to glory. Amen? He always wants us to be glorifying him, yes. to reveal glory. Amen? And he is progressive in every move he makes. That's why he says from glory to glory, being transformed or progressively being transformed or changed into this image. Amen. God is progressive in everything he does, yes. in every move he makes. Amen. And it's like Joseph's dream. Isaiah 9 and verse 7. Joseph is progressively, well, it's all kinds of resistance, but no matter how much resistance comes, he progresses on. It doesn't look like things are changing much, but the progression is what brings him to the place where God can actually reveal himself or manifest himself. So of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform it. Yeah. Praise God. Hallelujah. Amen. The truth itself is progressive. And multidimensional. Right. I mean, how many of you know truth is truth, and yet it can be multidimensional. It can mean the same truth can be one thing in a dimension that you're operating in today, and it can be something else tomorrow in another dimension. Still the same truth. It's still the truth. It's just how it impacts the dimensions that you happen to be operating in. Okay, so God gives me a promise, and I'm here in the earth, and it's the truth. But if I will progressively pursue it, believe it, trust in it, like what was being said here this morning, amen, that thing that I'm looking at today, that truth that I'm looking at today, will look altogether different in another dimension. Yeah. It'll change everything. Yes. Praise the Lord. So it's, it, it, truth, it, it, it's, it's progressive, but it, it evolves. It evolves as we grow. How many of y'all believe things today that you didn't believe 25 years ago? You would act on things today that you probably wouldn't have acted on maybe 25, 30 years ago. Right? It's, it's progressive. It's, it evolves. And it evolves into something that manifests the truth of God. Amen? But it never evolves into something that contradicts its foundation. So here's the deal. Again, I'm... I'm I apologize, Ron, for picking on you here, but you, you said it, so you get it, praise the Lord. But here's what I'm saying. See, the promise that God gave you, and it's true for all of us. I it just happened to know his because he shared it, right? So that truth is the truth. Praise God. It, is, it, it it's, it's evolves. It, it progresses. But even though he left the place he was in, where God later told him, that's where I wanted you to be, right? He, God just corrects the trajectory, keeps on doing the same thing. Everything remains the same because whatever happens, it cannot contradict the original truth. No matter what we do, we can't pervert the truth. We can stop it by not believing it, but as long as we believe it, even if we deviate from the purpose or the plan, the yeah. purpose will remain the same. Yes. Amen. If you maintain faith in the dream, in the yes. promise, in the whatever it was. 
He can change the trajectory and make it work out wherever you are. But you've got to maintain belief. You've got to continue in faith because he will never contradict the initial intent. The how to may change, but the manifestation cannot because it is predetermined before the foundation of the world. Before you were in your mother, you were, yes. you were picked and chosen for a specific purpose. Yes. That purpose ain't going to change. No. Praise the Lord. So it, it evolves, but it will not contradict the foundation. John chapter 3, verse 6 through 12. John chapter 3, verses 6 through 12. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but cannot tell whence it cometh and whither it goeth. So is every one that is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus answered and said unto him, How can these things be? Jesus answered and said unto him, Art thou a master of Israel? Knowest not these things? Verily, verily, I say unto thee, We speak what we do know, and testify that we have seen, and you receive not our witness. If I have told you earthly things and you believe not, how shall you believe if I tell you of heavenly things? Yeah. Praise the Lord. So Jesus just used two natural illustrations to illustrate spiritual life. First, he says childbirth. You have to be born of the Spirit. Yeah. Praise the Lord. And the wind. Now, the wind is the Spirit. And the Spirit isn't visible. Mm -hmm. Only the impact of the Spirit. I can't see the Spirit in you, but I can see the impact of the Spirit in you. Yes. Praise the Lord. And that's, what, that's, the, that's the information that is coming from this or the revelation that comes from this. You are new. You are a new you. You cannot see the new you. Mm -hmm. You can only see the impact mm -hmm. of the new you. Mm -hmm. You've been born again, and now you're of the Spirit. So Jesus had more to say about spiritual realities that have no earthly parallel. The spiritual reality I just shared with you has an earthly parallel, and that's the parallel he gave us. Childbirth and the wind, the natural, right? But he, the spiritual realities that Jesus wanted to go to them with, they couldn't receive them. Right. Because there wasn't any earthly parallel. They had not the Spirit of God, therefore they couldn't receive by the Spirit. They had to receive it naturally. They had to receive something that they could identify with to, to justify whatever it was that God was saying to them. Do you understand what I'm saying? So it's important because we are brokers of the heavenly realm. That's our job. Praise the Lord. We are the means by which God gets Himself, His presence, His Spirit, His promises, His His dreams into this earth. Yep. So if we don't understand spiritual things that have no earthly connection or, or uh, parallel, mm -hmm. then how are we going to do the work of God? Because here's what happens. We always dumb it back down to the natural. Yeah. We always go looking for a parable and then make the parable the reality, which is what the Jews were doing all the time. He'd tell them an earthly story to represent or to present a spiritual truth. They just took the, the natural story and ran with it. Yeah. Never got anything from the Spirit. Right. Well, there's no way. See, they got away with it. Well, they didn't really get away with it, but you understand what I'm saying. Yeah. We come along, and God doesn't give us that option. We don't have a fallback plan. We can't go back to, you know, uh, killing sheep and bulls and goats and all that kind of stuff. We, we can't go back to keeping a bunch of rules and thinking it's going to make God manifest somehow in this world. He's not going to do it. No. We have to move into the spirit realm. Uh -huh. yes. Yes. And you may not get a physical parallel to work from. True. Be good if it did because that, that makes us feel good. It's just like saying, hey, if you'll go out here and never smoke another cigarette, you'll go to heaven. Well, some people are going to be successful. Some people will give it up. But other people won't. But I can tell you, neither one of them is going to heaven because they either smoked or didn't smoke. Had nothing to do with it. They thought there was an earthly thing I can do 
that's going to make me get spiritual realities. And the truth is, it don't work that way. You either operate by the Spirit or you don't get the benefits of the Spirit. Praise the Lord. We are ambassadors assigned, given dominion over a planet in order to represent Jesus' name and do what Jesus did. Not to create another religion, not to, not to develop a new, you know, morality code or something. What good are we if we can't understand and operate in the spiritual realm that has no natural parallel? If all we can do is mimic the natural and try to make it spiritual. Yeah. See, this is what bugs me about revival. You, look, I've been there and done it, but when people are doing this kind of thing. There's nothing spiritual about that. But we think there is because if somebody got healed when somebody did that, we automatically assume that's what did it. He yelled loud enough. He jumped high enough. She ran far enough. No, it's got nothing to do with that. The shadow of a believer can bring healing. Because it's spirit. It doesn't have to be touched. It doesn't have to be felt. And we, But we've let... We've let the natural dictate to us what the spiritual is. And it's supposed to be the other way around. I'm not looking for natural anything. I'm looking for the supernatural. I've had all the natural I need. Praise the Lord. Glory to God. Hallelujah. So, we can't... We, what good are we going to be if we can't see... If we can't function spiritually, we're no better than an unbeliever. Right. The only benefit we're going to get is death. Yeah. And then you'll get heaven. Yeah. Genesis 39, verses 1 and 2. And Joseph was brought down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard of an Egypt, uh, an Egyptian, bought, brought, bought him uh, the hands of the Ishmaelites, which had brought him down hither. And the Lord was with Joseph. And he was a prosperous man, and he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. Now, let me tell you this story. I, I probably told it before. Some of you have been around long enough may have heard it. But a test pilot who broke the sound barrier. It's a true story. When he was approaching that barrier, he and everybody else thought the plane would just disintegrate. It, there was such vibration and shaking and rattling, and everything was just going bizarre. As he approached that barrier to the sound barrier, Everything begins to shake. But once he broke through, everything is calm as could be. He's going just as fast as he was when he broke the sound barrier. And leading up to breaking that barrier, everything looks like it's going to disintegrate and fall apart. But the moment he presses through that barrier, everything is just as peaceful as if he were floating on a lake somewhere. In every one of our lives, there's a barrier that we're going to have to break. Maybe multiple Barriers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You can tell when you get close to it because it looks like everything around you starts shaking. It looks like everything's going to fall apart. Yeah. But on the other side, it's smooth sailing. Mm -hmm. If you could just not give up to the fear of the right. sense of everything going to hell in a handbag, right. you could get to the place where yes. it's calm, where it's yes. smooth sailing again. But the problem is most people take the path of least resistance. If resistance come, quit. Yeah. 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 Right? Yeah. A man walks into a gift shop and uh, there was a parrot just inside the door. And when the guy passed the parrot, the parrot started cussing and calling the guy all kinds of nasty names. You ugly so-and-so, you no good low life, just physically abusing the guy. Right? The guy's a customer. <laughs> But the parrot's right there at the door, and he can't get in or out without going past the parrot. So the shopkeeper hears all this commotion, and he comes rushing over, and he slaps the parrot right across the head, knocks him off his perch. And then he said, you say that to one of my customers again, and I'm going to chop you into little pieces and cook you. Well, the parrot pouted for a little bit. And so the guy went on about his uh, shopping, and when he finished, he grabbed his things, and he headed for the door. And as he was kind of cautiously approaching the door and the parrot, he looked at the parrot. And the parrot looked back at him. And then the parrot looked at the shopkeeper. 
and then back at the man and said, you know. <laughs> Praise the Lord. So what I'm talking about is this. You know. It's already in your spirit. You don't need me to tell you. I'm just trying to encourage you to not let go of it. No matter what anybody tries to do to keep you from experiencing it, you know. Yes. It's in there. And it ain't going to leave you alone. No. Genesis 39, 1 through 6. It's already in your spirit. It's been in your spirit from before you were born. Yeah. You're not going to get rid of it. It's not going to go away. You just have to embrace it. Uh -huh. You have to yield to it. Joseph was brought down into Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, was captain of the guard, and the Egyptian brought him. Other hands, the Israelites, which had brought him down hither, and the Lord was with Joseph, and he was a prosperous man, and he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. And his master saw the Lord was with him, and that the Lord made all that he did to prosper in his hand. And Joseph found grace in his sight, and he served him, and he made him an overseer over his house, and all that he had he put into his hand. And it came to pass from that time, or from the time that he had made him an overseer in his house and over all that he had, that the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. And the blessing of the Lord was upon all that he had in his house and in the field. And he left all that he had in Joseph's hand. And he knew not aught he had save the bread which he did eat. And Joseph was a goodly person and well favored. Amen. So you see what was promoting uh, Joseph's dream. The dream itself. God, the promise the word yeah. is promoting him. As long as he stays faithful to it, as long as he yeah. will embrace it, as long as he'll keep believing it, yeah. it's going to come to pass. It's making this stuff come to pass. Yes. Amen. Yes. Joseph was raised up to be the prime minister of Egypt. Right. But before that happened, Potiphar's wife comes on the scene. Mm -hmm. And Satan uses her yeah. to tempt Joseph. Yeah. To leave God's promise and trust in human effort. Because his, the thinking would have surely been, hey, yeah. I make her happy. Yeah. She'll make Potiphar happy. Mm -hmm. And Potiphar will promote me. I've got somebody on my side. I'll have somebody who will help me. Right? Mm -hmm. Ephesians 4, verse 29. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. So Joseph, instead of yielding to what looked like in the natural, the easy way, right? The, the safest way. He refuses. He just simply said what God said. So you have to fight with the word of God. Yeah. If you do, you win. Yes. If you don't, you lose. If you go to your own means, yeah. you know, sometimes you, know, you feel like, hey, I just need to straighten this jerk out. Well, you may get a sense of satisfaction for blessing them out, but nothing positive is ever going to come out of it. Because right. it wasn't the plan that God had in the first place. It wasn't trusting God. It was trying to get even. Get over it. Feel good about myself for a minute. Do I make you feel lousy? Just what humans do. <clears throat> Stop looking at things that plant wrong images. Right. Yep. You have to make yourself turn away. You have to say, no. God's got a plan, and God's going to work the plan if I'll stay with the plan. Yep. If I deviate from the plan, now i got to figure out how God's going to do this another way. Because I think even if Joseph had committed adultery, God would have still got some somehow. But hey, it might have taken another 25 years. It might have taken who knows what, what, what else could have happened as a result. But God had a plan for him and it was going to come to pass. But it progressed the way it was supposed to because Joseph wouldn't move off of what God had said. Praise the Lord. Galatians 3.29. About down here. When the enemy comes and says, it ain't going to happen, you might as well just take the fast track, you might as well just try this, or 
forget about that, just do this, it'll be easier, it'll solve all your issues and everything else. That's when you just need to turn back to God, say, talk to the hand, you know, it's not listening. Here's the truth. No matter what it looks like, no matter how it seems to be progressing, this is the truth. And if you be Christ, then are you Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So we receive God's promise by faith. That dream or that promise means you're going to have to believe it. You're going to have to act on it. If you don't believe it and you don't act on it, you'll never see a manifestation. If you believe it, and if you'll act on it, you will have to see a manifestation. Yes. That dream and that promise means you're going to hang in there and trust what God said in spite of the circumstances. By revelation, see, you have access. Yes. By revelation, you have access to an inheritance. Yes. And that inheritance is beyond your wildest dreams. Yes. It's beyond your imagination. Amen. Yes. And before Jesus returns... Before he comes back for the church, there is going to be a community. We already read it, the prophecy in Isaiah and uh, in two or three different places in Isaiah. But before he returns, there's going to be a community of the redeemed that are walking under the influence of their inheritance. Yes. A city whose builder and maker yes. is God. That's what he called us. Yes. Praise the Lord. I believe that this is the generation, yes. amen, that will not just dream dreams, right. but will live the dream. Yes. He said that this generation, I was born in 1948, this generation that would see Israel come to be a nation again would not leave this earth before they saw the return of the Lord. So I may not be somebody, amen, that was born the year I was born is still going to be here when this happens and I'm saying I'm going to be the one. I'm going to be one of them at least. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. This is the generation that's going to live dreams, not just dream dreams. We're not just prophesying the future. We are the fulfillment of prophecy today for somebody else's future. That's why this great cloud of witnesses is looking down saying, we didn't get to be the part of that, but we got to pray for it. We got to believe for it. Now we're going to watch it. We're going to get to witness it. They couldn't be complete without us. In other words, their prophecy cannot be fulfilled unless we fulfill it. That's right. Our goal ought to be to agree with heaven all the time. Yes. Let our minds, our spirits, be the gate of heaven. Amen. Be the place where God accesses this realm. Yes. This was the entire focus of Jesus' ministry. Yep. To be the portal for God in this earth. And he said he left us for the same purpose. Yes. A desire to reveal things to us about what's happening in the spirit realm that have no corresponding earthly picture. I'm believing we'll have more dreams. We'll have more visions. We'll have, but they will come to fulfillment in our life, in our lifetime. Praise the Lord. God, I believe God is saying things to people right now that make absolutely no human sense. There's no, there's no natural way to relate to it. But he's going to do it. And he'll do it for the people that say, yes. I don't care how weird it looks. It can happen. If yes. he said it, it's going to happen. Yes. Look, somebody, somebody yes. had to believe in Azusa Street. Sure. Somebody had to believe for healings to actually still be a part of God's plan. Yeah. Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. Find something God's done, yeah. he's still doing it. If he isn't, it's only because he hasn't found anybody that will be the gate. That'll be the avenue through which he can come and manifest himself. We are kings and priests, ruling and reigning. Not only are we offering up the sacrifice, we're consuming the sacrifice. Praise the Lord. Our lives are to release the blessing as we are blessed with it. Absolutely. Praise yeah. the Lord. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever, yes. and he's right inside yes. of you. Yes. Wanting to reveal spiritual things yes. that have no earthly connection. He does. Yes. Just supernatural. Right. To think outside the box is the only way you're ever going to experience that. Mm -hmm. Fear will keep you from ever experiencing 
anything, let alone all that God yes. has. Amen. Praise the Lord. Fear not. Fear not. Amen. Hallelujah. You are blessed. Yes. Glory to God. Give the Lord a hand clap. This morning. Praise, the Lord. Praise the Lord. God bless all of you. Sorry for being a little over today. Enjoy the graduations. Have fun with family. The Lord bless you. Pray for me. I got to go to um. <laughs>